Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the National Capital Bible Church. Tonight we're looking at the five factors of effective faith. <clears throat> but before we look into our study, let's pause for a moment of silence and exercise 1 John 1 9, which says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So with our heads bowed, let's pray, and then I'll open in prayer in just a moment. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity for us to assemble together so that we can study your word. And we ask and pray these things in Christ's matchless name. Amen. We left off on page 36 last week. We're looking at the five factors of effective faith. What I'll do as customary is I'm going to hit his points, one through five, read on certain things on his points here, and then I'm going to give you my, my thoughts on the five factors of effective faith. So I will display it on the screen, and those online should be able to see it this time with the better fonts. So the five factors of effective faith, and he cites Daniel chapter 11, 32 to 35. And before I say anything else, did anybody <clears throat> prepare something based on what we have been discussing the last several weeks? Remember, the, um, what I'm asking for those who are comfortable is to come up with something based on the subject matter and pre present, uh, pretend like you're going to present the content. So for example, if the subject is five factors of effective faith, what would you say? What can you come up with? Did anybody do that? No, that's okay. I'll give you my, I'll give you my take on this so that you can see how I interact with any subject matter as I study. So five factors of effective faith, and you notice he lists five things that we're going to hit, the five. The first one is called the effective faith is built on genuine knowledge of God. And he says this means knowing God and not just knowing about him. So just on that alone, if you were to explain this to someone, what's the difference between knowing God and, and knowing about him? What's the difference? Sounds very elementary, and it is, but that's okay. It's not me, that's for sure. But think about this. He says the means, this means knowing God, not just knowing about him. I'm looking at number one on five factors of effective faith, page 36. What does he mean when he says, this means knowing God, not just knowing about him? What's the difference? Knowing why God created us and the universe and what his plan and purpose. Okay, knowing why he created us and his plan and purpose. Okay, that's one way. So remember, let me repeat. This means knowing God, not just knowing about him. Yeah, I'm believer to know about him. Okay. Okay, very good. So what else can we say? Because there's something here, there's a kernel of truth and a nuance here that I think is very important. Anybody else catch it? Knowing God versus knowing about him. What's the difference? Knowing God and knowing about him. Which one is relational? The first one. Very good. So He's saying the effective faith is built on gen genuine knowledge of God. And he says, this means you must know God, not just know about him. You see the difference? Knowing God relationally, not just knowing about him. He was born of a virgin, third, uh, second person of the Trinity. That's knowing about him. And that's important, but we must know him personally. That's relational. Knowing about him is facts. So knowing facts about Jesus is like any other religion. People know about Jesus. They say, oh, I believe in Jesus, but they don't have a relationship with him. So knowing God is different from knowing about him. 
Historically, we can know about Jesus Christ. He was here 2,000 years ago. The great philosophers know about him, but they don't know him personally. So we, know to, we, know, we come to know him as creator through creation. We find this in Romans 1, 18 to 21. We've looked at this in the past. Creation thunders his existence. Now, it doesn't present the gospel within creation, but as, as a person responds to the little light that God provides through creation, then God will give more light. He'll send people there, he'll send missionaries there as they respond to the light, as per Romans chapter 1. The second thing he mentions is something called effective faith is spiritual power at work. Notice what he uses here. He talks about James saying, faith without works is dead. Another way of saying that is faith without works is useless. Faith, though it's faith, without works is useless. So it takes faith, faith takes the power of God's Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, and puts it to work in life. Power is the characteristic of the growing Christian, the maturing Christian, the advancing Christian. So that's effective faith and spiritual power at work. Number three, effective faith turns personal faith into public ministry. So he's, again, these are the five factors of effective faith. Number three for him is faith, if it's effective, will eventually turn your personal faith into public ministry. You'll take it out on the streets, in other words. You'll take what's personal and take it out in the street, public. First it's personal, then it becomes public. It's between you and God, and it's a vertical relationship, for, vertical relationship first, your priesthood. So your relationship with God in privacy, and if that's intact, then your ambassadorship or your relationship with the world begins to come out as a public ministry, as he mentions here in point number three. So effective faith turns into public ministry. Effective faith turns personal faith into public ministry. And he says, every believer in Christ is an ambassador of the Lord. And he cites the various passages there. You can read that when you have an opportunity. And he does say, a priest of God, a minister to other believers. So those are our responsibility as one having effective faith. That's three. Let's look at number four. Number four, effective faith will always result in what? Do you guys agree with that? If you're standing your ground, will you experience persecution? That's what he's saying there, right? Number four, effective faith will always result in persecution. Think about that. In times of persecution, God gives the believer who is faithful a little help because a little help combined with effective faith is always enough. He goes on to say, it only took David one stone and faith to slay Goliath because the world hates Jesus Christ. It also hates and persecutes those who most reflect him. So what Gene is saying here is that faith, if it's effective, will ultimately result in persecution. Why is that? Because of what Jesus said in John 15. Because the world hates me, it will also hate you and persecute those who most reflect him. If they hate me, they will hate you. Remember that when Jesus said that to his disciples? Mm -hmm. So effective faith will ultimately result in persecution. Can you think of any examples of being persecuted today uh, as one who um, exhibits faith? Effective faith. He says, effective faith will always result in persecution. True or false? You see it all over the news today that uh, Christians are the ones that are the haters. Christians are the ones that are haters. They are the ones that are haters. That's right. And so uh, when they believe that, that's going to be kind of a test. A test for you at all times to be careful. You know, not, not to be careful as a Christian, but. Uh, understand where they're coming from and, and trying to deflate their, their 
Can you imagine that? That's so true. Right. So true. When a Christian stands up for his or her faith, we're the haters. We're the racist. We're the problem. So we're being persecuted in a different way by being accused of being evil. Think about that. We're not doing anything evil. In fact, if anything, we're doing something that's gracious. We're doing something that's proper and right. Extending love, extending grace to those who are without Christ, without hope, and without salvation. And yet, we get accused for being the wrongdoers, the racists, the, the evil ones. That's the mindset of the culture today. It's so backwards. What else? Mike, were you going to say something? What is an effective faith resulting in persecution in the context of what Gene is saying in number four? Anybody else? Thanks, God. Bill, Baron, Vanessa? Can you think of an example? Uh, no, no good turn goes unpunished. Okay. Very good. It's not very recent, but Bonhoeffer from World War II. Bonhoeffer, okay. How about something contemporary or 21st century, like maybe someone we know as a believer? Can you think of an example of effective faith because he or she has been standing for his faith, her faith? There, it's resulting in persecution. We think, we think of pastors in Pakistan, right? Yeah. They're being persecuted. So that's an example. Anything else come to mind? We have missionaries that are being persecuted, right? So it's definitely all around us. Number five, effective faith follows a path of continual refining and purifying. This is the faith-to-faith -faith principle found in Romans 1, 17. So <clears throat> what I did by way of... Um, he goes on to say the top of in Daniel 12.3 we see the ultimate end of those who pursue and attain the effective faith top of 38 our resurrection bodies will shine like the stars of heaven some faintly others brilliantly what, which one which will you choose to be bright and brilliant or faint top of 38 so now I'm going to give you my thoughts this is if I, were ha ha if I had to teach this class with my own personal notes after my research. But this time what I did was, remember, what, notice what he started the, the chapter, this chapter with. The, what's the topic called? Five factors of effective faith. And what did he cite as the passage? So why not look at Daniel 11, 32 to 35? How's that for starters? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if his book was aligned with Daniel 11. I, I, te I tend to think that he did. But I looked at this passage and looked to 32 to 35, and I was able to draw things based on research. You know, you, you look through... The material that you have at your disposal, you use research, commentaries, uh, software. And here's what I was able to find out. As I went through Dan, Daniel 11, 32 to 35, I went point one, two, three, four, five as well. Look at point number one. On his book, he says, effective faith is built on genuine knowledge. Remember that? If you have your little booklet, those online, I'm looking at page 36 and I'm connecting it with my, my material, my thoughts here on what's on the screen. So my number one is taken from Daniel 11.32, understanding. So he says, For number one, he put effective faith is built on genuine knowledge. 
So I found five factors of effective faith from the book of Daniel, specifically 32 to 35, since he cited that. Number one, understanding. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take what? Take action. You find that in verse 32. Verse 32 of Daniel 11. I'm using his passage that he, he cited for five factors of effective faith, so I thought I would draw from that section. And then number two, he put effective faith is spiritual power at work. Number two, I put strength. Number one is understanding. Number two is strength. And notice in Daniel 11.32, same verse. Shall stand firm and take action. That's taken from the same chapter, same book. So the action is preceded with standing firm. So it seems like action, in order for it to, to be the result, we have to first stand firm. In order for us to be able to produce action, we have to stand firm on understanding, which is number one. The people who, what's number one say on my notes here? Okay, very good. Th thank you, Darren. So, notice what I'm putting here. If I, I said number one is, when you look at 1132, understanding the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Do you see that in 32? The strength found in that shall stand firm and take action. But that's preceded with understanding. Because it also says, the people who know their God shall stand firm, and then they will take action. So before they can take action, before they can be fortified, they have to know their God. If they know their God, they'll be able to stand firm, and if they can stand firm because they're knowing God, they will then take action. You see the progression there? They know their God, they know God, they're able to stand firm, and because they know God and they're standing firm, they can therefore take action. Number two, strength. It's also revealed in 32. They shall stand firm and take action. So it progresses. They know God, they stand firm, they take action, Understanding, strength two, and number three, boldness. Taken from 32 again. The people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. The boldness is a direct consequence of knowing God, which then will lead to standing firm or inner stability, and therefore allowing them to take action. Which will then lead to number four on my points here taken from verse 33, the next verse, and the wise among the people shall make what? Many understand. Uh, Scott, what does 33 say in your Bible? Do you, what are you using? Okay, so the wise, those who are, have knowledge among the people, shall make many understand. So there's the beacon of light there among the ones who are wise among the people. They'll make uh, many understand. So there's going to be someone who's going to be, be able to reveal the knowledge. And so you see this progression, understanding, strength, boldness, and then teaching. And then number five, from what I gather up to 35, is perseverance. I'm not talking about perseverance of the saints, proving you're saved, but there's this enduringness about the individual, about those who are understanding their God, standing firm, taking action, having a sense of boldness, 
being able to speak and share among the wise, making many understand. And then number five, perseverance, they shall stumble, some of them to refine and to cleanse them and to make them white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. So there's going to be a time where there's going to be a purging or a purification for those who are believers. There's going to be a time where sometimes we'll, be going, we'll go through trials. We'll go through difficulties. And so in Daniel 11.35, there's this sense where it's a purification process, the hardship that is, which is similar to James 2. Count it all joy when you go through trials and tribulations, knowing that this is going to be the testing of your faith. So they shall stumble, some of them, to refine, to cleanse them, and to make them white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. Now, let me just read another translation just for those, just for us so that we can hear, get another sense of how this is rendered. Sometimes uh, another translation makes it a little easier, especially in a passage like this. So, Daniel 11, 35. Some of the wise will fall victim to persecution. In this way, they will be refined and cleansed and made pure until the time of the end, for the appointed time is still yet to come. That's verse 35 of Daniel 11, another translation of this perseverance thing that I found in verse 35. So there you have one, two, three, four, five, based on Daniel 11 alone. So there's a sense of understanding for effective faith in the book of Daniel, 11, 32 to 35. So number two is strength. You find this in 32. Number three has a sense of boldness. So there's this inner strength now, being able to stand up. The people who know their God shall stand firm, and then they'll be able to take action. Number four, there's a sense of teaching, sharing. The wise among the people shall make many understand. And then number five, you get this perseverance. There's this ongoing uh, time where there's going to be a purging or um, a cleansing for the believer until the time of the end. So sometimes God will allow the believer to go through trials in such a way that at the moment it seems harsh but it's a cleansing and a purification for those who are believers and rooted in him. So on the bottom I said, these verses highlight the attributes and actions associated with effective faith as found in Daniel 11. So all I did was I took his passage and I found five effective faith as based on what he said in his uh, five points and then I overlaid it on Daniel 11 and I sought to find things that I thought would be five core elements of effective faith. Understanding, strength, boldness, teaching, perseverance. I think that encompasses 32 to 35. You see this in Daniel. So now I'd like to take us to this again continuation of what I decided to find from the Bible is examples of factors of effective faith by believers in the Bible, not just Daniel. So I'm going to bring five other gentlemen up to the witness stand, starting with Abraham. So I, when you think of Abraham, you can think of his obedience, Abraham's willingness to obey God's command to sacrifice his son Isaac. We find this in Genesis 30, 22, 1 to 18. Uh, this is one of my favorite passages when thinking about obedience and trust. So let's turn to Genesis 22. I realize some of this is things that we've looked at in the previous studies because some of these doctrines op um, intersect and are repeated because that's what doctrine is all about. It's, when you talk about one doctrine, sometimes it spills over into another. 
whether we're talking about the sovereignty of God, the omniscience of God, it all ties together. So Genesis 22, and I'll read it for the sake of the recording and those online. Genesis 22, 1 to 18. These are some examples of believers in the Bible as far as effect, examples of effective faith. So I'm looking at the life of Abraham now. Genesis 22. One through 18. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Anything stand out to you guys on the opening of this passage? in Genesis 22. Anything pop? Anything stand out to you guys? Genesis 22, 1, 2, 1 and 2. I read those two verses. Did anything jump out at you regarding this verse? What do we know? What's there? What's not there? Abraham has a relationship with God. Very good. Abraham has a relationship with God. And what else? Okay, there's a command from God himself. What did God say? I mean, what do we get from here? From 1 and 2. Okay. Do you see it in the text? A test. Do we see it initially as a test? Yes, it is. See, that, that's why we see what's there. Read it, Mike. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, So this is actually a test for Abraham. Sometimes the text itself will reveal to us why God does certain things. So right off the bat, it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. So this is a test for Abraham. Right from the very beginning, it tells us that for Abraham and God, there is a relationship, Mike. But right now, amidst this relationship, God is telling us through the word of God that this is a test. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Verse 2, he said, take now your son. Here's the unfolding of the test. Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. So you can sense that there's a going to be a difficulty here because the word of God is giving some information here by letting us know that Isaac is a son that Abraham loves, whom you love. Take him and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. And he doesn't even know where. On one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So what's that say? He has to follow, but trust him. Why? He doesn't know specifically yet in verse 3 or verse 2 where he's going except it's going to be in Moriah, the land of Moriah. But in the land of Moriah, there's many mountains there. So he's going to trek to the mountain of Moriah and he's going to take his son and he's got a heavy heart because he loves his son and God is testing him. Offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain, on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. He didn't tell him here yet. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship. And what's it say next? We will return. We will come back to you. So there's that faith element already. It's clearly seen in verse 5. We'll be back. Not I will be back, but we will be back. 
So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the lad and do, do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there beheld, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. You think that was a difficult time? That's very stressful, I'm sure. A father who loved his son, asked by God himself to sacrifice his only son, or the son that he loved. So please remember that because you'll, you'll, you'll understand why in the, my following notes. So that's Abraham number one. Examples of believers who exhibited factors of effective faith. Abraham is number one. Number two is Moses' perseverance. Moses' leadership and perseverance in leading the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt despite facing challenges and setbacks. Intercession. There's a sense here where Moses' intercession for the Israelites pleading with God on their behalf for mercy and forgiveness. So let's look at Exodus 32 and Numbers 14. If someone can get Exodus 32 and someone Numbers 14 to help me out, I would appreciate it. Exodus 32 first. Let's read 11 to 14. Exodus 32. Does anybody have Exodus 32? And if you do, kindly read it, beginning with verse 11. And then Moses pleaded with the Lord, with God, and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with great mighty men? Yes, up to uh, 14, please. Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out of brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountain, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from from the harming to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servant, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land <coughs> that I have spoken of, uh, I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the, <coughs> so the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do very good. So what do we get from what we just read there, Exodus 32, 11 through 14? What did Moses do? He laid out a case. He laid out a case and said what? Uh, the Egyptians will make fun of you. That's right. You, you kill your people. You kill your people. So... I guess he, he made God think. 
Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm sure well, he, he made God think, and we know in eternity past, yeah. God knew this. Right. Similar to Adam and Eve, he knew that was going to happen. It never challenges his omniscience. But it shows intercession. On the, God's people, when, his leaders, when they would intercede, we can see that God will listen, right? So what, we find this in Exodus 32. And when you look at Moses, this is just one snapshot of his leadership. It's phenomenal. I want us to look at Numbers 14 as well. Let's, who has Numbers 14? Bill, you do? Okay. Uh, so 13 through 19? Yes, 13 through 19. <clears throat> When Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it, for by your strength you brought up this people from their midst. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people, for you, O Lord, are seen eye to eye, where your cloud stands over them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now if you slay this people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, because the Lord could not bring his people into the land which he promised them by oath, Therefore he slaughtered them in the wilderness. But now I pray that the power of the Lord be great, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations. Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your loving kindness, just as you also have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Wow. Did you hear that? What did Moses say? What did he do before God? What was he citing? What, he was, re what was he recalling? His own words. He, he, word right he was putting God, he was saying, God, did you not say this? And because of the intercession of Moses, twice now, God held back. This is a, an effective faith demonstrated. We saw Abraham. We saw Moses. I have another guy. Number three. David. Courage. I put David's bravery in facing Goliath. We, one of our favorite stories, right? Trusting in God's strength to deliver him and the Israelites. We find this in 1 Samuel 17. Repentance, David's heartfelt repentance and plea for forgiveness after his sin with Bathsheba. We find this in Psalms 51. We'll not go through this because I, I still have something that I'd like to share. Daniel, number four, I see a sense of prayerfulness, Daniel's commitment to prayer, even when it was outlawed. You know what was outlawed? Demonstrating his confidence or his faith in God's sovereignty and guidance. We find this in Daniel chapter six, Daniel six. He also expresses faithfulness, exhibits faithfulness, his refusal to compromise his faith by bowing down to false gods or abandoning his prayer routine, even when threatened with death. Can you do that? No. That's going to be really hard, right? His life was threatened, but he still maintained his stance. Daniel 1 and Daniel 3. Faithfulness. So now, we have Peter. His confession, Peter's bold confession of Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah, you find this in Matthew 16. You also see his um, repentance and restoration in John 21, 15 to 19, where he was repentant and he was restored by Christ after denying him three times. So these biblical examples illustrate various aspects of this thing called effective faith as per this chapter, including obedience, perseverance, courage, prayerfulness, faithfulness, confession, repentance, and restoration. Those are a part of the effective faith, factors of effective faith as I see in these gentlemen. Now, by way of application, you're saying, okay, 
these five uh, examples are, are great, but how does that help me out? I'm glad you asked. I want to give you now an example of how this could look like today. Remember I was asking you how it looks like, right? What's a, an example today with Pakistan, uh, missionaries? Now I'm going to take these individuals and show how you and I can probably go through something similar as an example, right? So for example, Abraham, his obedience. So a modern day example of obedience might be a person who sacrificially gives up a promising career opportunity to serve in a challenging mission field or chooses to prioritize their family's needs over personal ambitions. You see what I just did? Let me repeat. If we're going to look at Abraham's example, as I mentioned in number one, his obedience, what did he obey? Sacrificing. Who did he, who did he, who was he asked to sacrifice? His son Isaac. So likewise, obedience to God. Practically speaking, listen closely, a modern day example today of obedience might be a person who sacrificially gives up a promising career opportunity to serve in a challenging mission field or chooses to prioritize their family's needs over personal ambitions. You see what I just did? The sacrifice as seen in Abraham, if we're going to pull it to the 21st century, maybe the person might not be offering their son or daughter up as a living sacrifice or as a sacrifice, burnt saf sacrifice to God, but how about the person who gives up a promising career opportunity to serve in a challenging mission field as m missionary or chooses to prioritize their family's needs over their own personal ambitions? Because instead of getting a career and making money, they choose to protect and take care of the home and their personal, their families, their family is now a priority over their personal goals and objectives. That would be similar to the sacrifices seen in Abraham. Well, that's, that's similar to you. Similar to me. Mm -hmm. Similar. But do you guys follow me? I'm just taking the sacrifice that Abraham, we saw in Abraham's life my first example, when we went back several slides, and Abraham was asked as a test, remember? It was a test. It was a test to offer up his son. Was that a sacrifice? Mm -hmm. Yes. Was that a little sacrifice or a ma major sacrifice? Major sacrifice. So listen to what I'm saying here. A person who sacrifices or gives up a career, a career path, to serve as a missionary, for example, or mission field, and chooses or chooses to prioritize their family's needs over personal ambitions. So in other words, instead of going and making big money and lots of money, let's just say, I'm the example here, I'm gonna s instead prioritize and stay home with the family because I think that's more important. Although I was hoping to, by this time in my life, at, at the age of, 57, 47, whatever. I was hoping, like how it's light, let's just say at this certain age, I was hoping to be making X number of dollars by this year, but I didn't because I opted to take care and prioritize my family. Can you see the sacrifice? Yeah. That's similar to what Abraham did. And now we took it over to the 21st century. Sacrifice, sacrifice. Yes. It has to be relation, relation, relational to God's will, of course. Yeah. So, for example... Well, I can see your first example, but the second one, I don't think that's, that's any different to God's will. I think it does, because the home life is so important. You rear the child or the children in the context of, of a biblical home life rather than in a secular home life and so there's a better 
outcome of training your children in the ways of the Lord rather than a, in a secular school that may take them and take them in all sorts of directions. So now I turn my back on a nice paying career or job and I said, Lord, I'm going to prioritize my family because that's more important and I, bring, I believe that this is going to bring you honor and glory. Rather than going out and making X number of dollars per month, per year, I'm going to prioritize my children because children are a gift from God. So I want them to be reared in the Word. That's, Scott. That's why it goes back to your understanding that you can understand that you're, uh, uh, you're grown enough to understand God's plan for your life and will. You'll understand too the doors will be open, doors will be closed. Right. So if you say, God, do your will is for me to go in the mission field. That's uh, right. Open up that door. And then I, I guess it doesn't become as much a sacrifice when you understand that you're doing God. That's true. Uh, so it's well things where it comes down to having faith in God's plan for your life, uh, and whatever the door opens, monetary. You, you wouldn't choose for sure, right? Or you know, uh, or the other one. So I, I can see where you could take that different different ways. Where yeah. It is a sacrifice mm -hmm. because he did make the, the million bucks he talked to you. Yeah. Very good observation. I like that, Scott. And uh, I, I agree. Uh, Debbie? Yeah, sometimes it's a sacrifice. That's right. Because I thought that that was more important than making money. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to be as happy in the truck, but you, you know, you're going to have to be as happy knowing that that was the right tool yeah. for you. Yeah. Well, that, that was the right decision for my children. Yeah. I mean, if I would have come to work and said, well, I don't know how to work, but for my children, yeah, that was, and you know what? Sometimes it might not even turn out the way you think. That's right. Your children might not even be grateful for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Very good. laughs> That's right. No, I totally agree, Debbie. And it, sometimes it's just it winds up to be a, just a sacrifice. Right. But if you think about it, wasn't that the case for uh, Abraham? Yeah. He wasn't expecting anything except uh, that he's going to come back. So um, that was a, a, a leap of faith. Yeah. Mike? And I don't think Isaac appreciated it. Either. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Isaac could have probably kicked his butt. I mean, he was supposed to be a, a teenager by that time. I often wonder, like, how that went. And he's like, all right, let me tie you up real quick, son. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't say anything about it. It doesn't. It doesn't. You know, I mean, but the, like living, he said, all right, here we go. Listen, Isaac. That's a good son. He just obeyed. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure he told that son to his, his son quite a bit. Probably. Yeah. What we do know is that that's why I wanted to hone in on what you found, Mike. It was a test. As long as we know right from the get-go it was a test, then sometimes when we go through something like what I'm saying here, a modern-day example, sacrificially giving up a promising career, or pri prioritizing the family, that could also be a test. So, and that's why we have to think about the biblical principles, and I think Scott alluded to this as well, that we have to know his word, so that when we know his word, then it won't be a struggle anymore, it'll be a joy, actually, when you make these sacrifices, because you know you're in God's will. So in the life of Abraham, that was difficult. So if we think of 
ourselves as going through some kind of sacrifice similar to that of Abraham, I think it would be something like this as an example. Now Moses, here's the guy who interceded. So we also know, for example, as far as perseverance is concerned, that's what I put here for Moses, someone facing long-term adversity such as chronic illness or financial struggles um, who continues to trust God in God's provision and remain steadfast in their faith despite the difficulties they face. Do you guys see that? Similar to that of Moses? So their long-term struggles and they're continuing to trust God in spite of what they're currently going through because Moses had a difficult time with not one person, not two people, millions. Some say five, some say seven million <coughs> Jews following his lead. And so I could just imagine he was very stressed out trying to oversee these Jews and being a mouthpiece for God, even though they were trying to kill him at some points. So here, think about this. So in the contemporary sense, it would be like someone facing a long-term adversity. Could be chronic illness, could be financial struggles, it could be, and continues to trust God, to trust in God's provision, and continues to remain steadfast in their faith despite the difficulties they currently face. So hopefully you can see that because what I'm doing again is just trying to bring it up to speed. And what if there was a Moses type situation, now we're looking at a David type of situation. A David situation would be a person standing up for their faith in a hostile environment, such as a student, think about this, a student defending their beliefs in a secular university setting or a Christian facing persecution for their beliefs in a country where Christianity is not tolerated. That make sense? So that would be similar to a David situation. Number four, how about Daniel? Prayerfulness and faithfulness. So my example here would be a believer who maintains a consistent prayer life, life despite a busy schedule finding time to seek God's guidance and strength in the midst of work, family, and other responsibilities. Sometimes it's hard, right? We're so busy at times that it's, it's hard to pray and find time for prayer, but this would be an example of a Daniel today, someone who's gonna maintain a consistent prayer life despite a busy schedule. Finding time to seek God's guidance and strength in the midst of work in the midst of family and all the responsibility, cooking, laundry, and the rest. And so in spite of all that, this person is consistently in tune with God in the area of prayer. Then the, the other faith, effective faith component would be faithfulness. So Daniel today would be someone who refuses to compromise their principles and values even when faced with temptation or pressure to conform to societal norms that contradict their faith. Do we have any Daniels? Do we know any Daniels? Anybody who's willing to refuse to compromise their principles? Not easy at times, but that would be the Daniel in my perspective as I see what we just covered. He was faithful, he was a prayer warrior. Those two stand out to me as part of the effective faith factors as seen in these five men. So Daniel exhibited a life of prayer. He was faithful. And so if you want to see someone who is similar to David, it's a believer who maintains a consistent prayer life in, despite the busy schedule. He, he or she is finding time to seek God's guidance and strength in the midst of work, family, and other responsibilities. And also, like Daniel who was faithful, this man or woman, this man or woman would be faithful in the sense of someone who refuses to compromise 
their principles and values even when faced with temptation or pressure to conform to societal norms that contradict their faith. Do we have any Daniel type of people today? I think this is what it would look like. They would be, they would be consistent with prayer and they would be faithful in spite of the pressure that they undergo. They're going to stand their ground and say, I don't care. I know that this is what you guys believe in. I know that this is what the general culture believes in. No, I have my own personal beliefs. I will not succumb to that. That goes against my own personal convictions. You can do it. I won't. Do we have any people like that? That would be a Daniel type of person. Okay. Number five. How about Peter? Well, we have to talk about his confession, repentance, and restoration. Peter, uh, we saw how he confessed and uh, make, a make a stand. He stood up for Christ. A person openly sharing their faith with others, boldly proclaiming Jesus as Lord and Savior in their workplace, school, community, regardless of the potential ridicule or rejection. That would be a Peter today. Also, when it comes to repentance and restoration, it would be someone who acknowledges their mistakes and seeks forgiveness, then experiences the transformative power of God's grace as they're restored to fellowship with God and others. So there you have it, five people from the Bible. But these five now are today. So we saw, what I did was right here. So we talked about Abraham, right? Abraham was number one, Moses was number two, David was number three, Daniel was number four, Peter was number five, and then what I did was, okay, if we're to look at them today, a believer today, it would look like one, two, three, four, and five, okay? 21st century. Well, that concludes our study, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you were able to get something out of this. And next week we will look at, what's next? Five techniques, page 38. So if you are open, create a study, kind of like what I did. And you don't have to stand up here, but just do it as a form of exercise and challenge yourself. See if you can come up with something. See if you can, the five, the five techniques of the Christian way of life. See what you would come up with, just for kicks. And you don't have to come up here. I won't ask you to come up here unless you are comfortable in coming up here. But we'll go through this rather quickly, and I'll give you my example of what I come up with, the five techni techniques of the Christian way of life. He talks about confession, spirituality, living in the Word, and occupation with Christ. This is easy stuff. This is stuff that we should know. But can you come up with an additional five? That's the thing. Can you come up with five additional techniques aside from these five? So having said that, let's close in a word of prayer and that will conclude our class for tonight. Father, thank you as always for the opportunity to examine your word and the key doctrines as found in your word. We are grateful for what was accomplished on the cross of Calvary. And because of Christ, we have everlasting life. We thank you for the love that has been bestowed upon the world. And we know how important it is for us as believers to advance the cause of Christ so that others, those without Christ, without hope, and without salvation can be exposed to that truth, that they too can have life everlasting if they would simply believe in him for it. I thank you for every believer here in National Capital Bible Church, and I continue to pray for each individual that we, can, we would continue to make a stand and let people know about our pivot here in Springfield, that they too can learn the doctrines from your word and to be a part of a strong fellowship that uh, prioritizes God and his word. We're living in a day and age where it's mocked and ridiculed, as we've seen, Father, there are several examples in Scripture which we can learn from and we can adjust our personal lives to mirror the examples that set forth in the Old Testament especially. And so we're grateful for the things that we've studied. Help us to retain these things so that it's not just mere academic knowledge, but that we would be able to utilize it and apply it in our personal lives. 
We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.